So thank you uh, for the invitation. So there's a one here. <laughs> there will be a two tomorrow. Okay, so I, I thank uh, Peter for the invitation and for his interest in our work. And uh, the most important thing is that, is that it's joint work with Alex Drewitz and uh, Alexis Prévost, who are both uh, based in Cologne at the moment. Um, okay, so so let me uh, let me introduce uh, what this is about. So so I want to consider phi, uh, which is uh, the Gaussian free field uh, on the lattice, and uh, I'm going to assume that d is always greater or equal to three. So uh, so I can describe this by uh, some probability measure p, which is such that uh, the field is centered, so it's zero boundary condition, and uh, the covariances are given by the green function uh, of the lattice Laplace. Well, since this is a probability seminar, so this is uh, the green function of the simple random walk. So it's the expected number of times that the walk started at x spans at y. OK, this is, uh, this is uh, positive. Perhaps more importantly, it's finite, uh, because dimension is greater or equal to 3, and it's, uh, it's positive definite. <coughs> OK, so that's the, that's the Gaussian free field. And uh, so now there is uh, some random subset that you can uh, create out of this which are the level sets. And I'm going to look at the level sets above some number, which I will call h, the height. So h is a real parameter. Uh, this is a random subset of uh, zd, and it's decreasing in h. Um, and you know, it's a nice subset, so its law is translation invariant and, uh, and mixing, so it has all the good properties that you might want from a random sub subset of ZD. And uh, so there was a question of uh, Leibovitz and Saleur. Uh, this was in 86, uh, which is uh, about the percolation of the set. OK, so in other words, um, uh, you know, for which values of H does, does this thing uh, have an infinite uh, um, connected component. OK, and um, so what makes this problem a little bit interesting, of course, is that uh, uh, you have strong correlations in this model. So this decays like, you know, a slow algebraic decay. And, uh, and so saying things about the percolation phase transition of, of this set are perhaps a little less trivial than, uh, than an ordinary percolation. OK, so uh, I'm going to survey a, a few uh, known results about this. So, so to describe the percolation phase transition, I'm going to introduce the corresponding critical parameter, h star, which depends on the dimension. And that's the smallest h uh, such that the probability that this set has an infinite cluster is equal to 0. Right, this this uh, function of h is decreasing in h because those guys are decreasing in h. And uh, you know, a priori, this is a number on the extended real line. Uh, but if you assume for a second that h star is finite, which is saying that the phase transition is non-trivial, and I'm about to tell you that. Uh, so if you assume this for, for, for the moment, then the picture is that above this value of h star, uh, uh, the level sets do not percolate. And below this value, you have, in fact, uh, a unique, it's unique by a classical argument of Burton and Keene, uh, uh, infinite connected component. So I will use the words connected component and clust uh, infinite cluster uh, uh, interchangeably. OK, connectivity is always meant in the nearest neighbor sense. <coughs> OK, so, so the subcritical regime uh, lies here, and, and the supercritical 
below H star, which uh, will take you a couple of minutes getting used to. Sure, I mean, you, you could do it the other way around. So th the level is H. Right, so, so, so these, these are just the points where I'm above, and then, so it's true that if I take H equal to zero, the two sets have the same law, yes, because the... Mean zero. Yeah, the mean is zero, yeah. Is it? C'est bon? <laughs> okay. All right, so, 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 you know, this is how it was set up in the original paper, and I wanted to keep it that way. OK, so now uh, some known results. Uh, so, so. so here's the here's theorem. Uh, so first of all, um, h star of d is greater or equal to 0 for any d greater or equal to 3. That means that you have an infinite cluster above every uh, negative level, be it as small as you like, and also that h in dimension 3 it's also finite so you have a non-trivial phase transition in dimension 3 and these results are due to Brickmont, uh, Lebowitz and Mass in a paper from 87 okay and then <clears throat> more recently uh, with uh, Snitman we completed this picture by proving that h star is indeed finite for all dimensions greater or equal to 3. So here there is a problem in the argument because in, in, in higher dimensions a random walk will not hit every infinite set, so particularly not necessarily another random walk. So, so, so this is, was a, a problem. Okay, so we, we, uh, we complemented their results. So this was uh, when I started my PhD thesis. And I think uh, this came about because uh, Leibovitz was giving a talk for a birthday conference of Varadan, and uh, Snitman was in the audience, and I was the lucky PhD student who was around. So this is sort of the history of this problem. OK, and then uh, afterwards, um, uh, I showed with uh, Alex Drevitz that in high dimension, this grows to leading order, like 2 log d. So this is as d goes to infinity. And this, uh, this is just you know, uh, telling you that you, the leading asymptotics of, of the critical uh, uh, density, if you, so if, suppose you define the critical density uh, PC, which is you know, the probability that at any point you are above h star, then uh, you know, this decays to leading order like, like 1 over d. And this is the usual tree asymptotics you would get in high dimensions. So the, the precise result we, we have is, I guess, you know, we have 1 plus theta law of 1. So it's, it's very, it's only the leading order asymptotics. OK, so, so, all right, so you know that this guy sits somewhere on the real line where it should for any dimension. And then there was a conjecture by these three gentlemen. Uh, that in fact, um, uh, h star was strictly positive in any dimension greater or equal to three. So in particular, you know that would means that h star lies somewhere here. So in particular, if you look at the sign clusters of the free field, those are the level sets above and below zero. They would both have an infinite uh, connected component. But this is strictly stronger. This is like saying that P c is strictly less than a half which incidentally is known in dimension 3 for ordinary Bernoulli percolation by work of uh, Campanino and Rousseau. OK. Wait, what is P here? What is? So PC would be th this, right? The corresponding density to this, oh. uh, just to phrase it in. OK, and so, so the theorem that I want to present uh, so first of all, there was also some compelling numerical evidence. So I don't know the whole history, but uh, recently there was a 
the thesis of a student of Leibovitz, I think uh, Marinov, who, who computed that uh, uh, PC should be even well below one half, so roughly 0.1. So numerics uh, in dimension three. Numerics. Okay. Well, I guess if you if you think about this being roughly maybe uh, one over h star e to the minus uh, h star squared over two, maybe two or something like that, yeah. Right, because uh, it gives you e to the minus two, one over nine. Okay. okay it's quite big. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the theorem that I would like to present. Uh, is that uh, is a confirmation of this conjecture. So this is indeed true. <coughs> OK, so, um, so I will give you an overview of, uh, of the argument today. And then tomorrow, I will uh, elaborate on, on some of the details. But ideally, you should be able to walk out today and not come back tomorrow and, and still see. I know I'm not advertising myself very well. <laughs> OK. People have things to do. <laughs> right. OK. That's also <laughs> possible. All right, that's what used to do. <laughs> OK, so, um, so if you have uh, paid attention, you have realized that actually uh, these three men uh, get us pretty close to what we want, because they already tell us that um, you need to have an infinite cluster above uh, a negative, uh, any negative height. And um, I was tempted to actually give you the argument, because it's very uh, elegant, and it's only a few lines. I, I won't do it, because I'm afraid that uh, you know, time has this tendency of flying by. So um, anyways, but you know, the argument is essentially by contradiction. So, so you, know, you probe the field in 0, and, and you show that it's too costly not to have a, an infinite cluster uh, above a negative level, if you want to think about it, you know, it's like uh, Euclid's theorem. You know that you have infinitely prime numbers, but you don't know anything about them. So here you know you have an, in, an infinite cluster, but you, you know, the, it's not constructive. So, so the strategy of, uh, of the proof is going to consist of first uh, making uh, this result in the first line uh, uh, quantitative. So quantify. Uh, star and star is this. Okay, so what I mean by this is construct uh, the infinite cluster above any negative level. I will uh, write this for the infinite cluster. Uh, so for for h positive uh, explicitly And, uh, and in fact, we're going to, to augment this cluster. So we're, we're, we're going to uh, improve a little bit on this result. OK. The second thing we're going to show, so this gives you an infinite cluster above a negative level. And you would ideally like to show that you have an infinite cluster above a small positive level. So the second thing we're going to show is that uh, uh, this thing that we construct is actually robust in a certain sense. And so, so this is the technical part. And this is, uh, this is delegated to tomorrow. So I will present the statement, but I, I won't say anything about the proof today. And then the third step is to use these two things and, and show that you can somehow perturb above a negative level and get the uh, get a percolating cluster above a positive level. So it's a perturbative argument when h is close to 0. OK, so that's roughly the strategy. All right, so, so the first step, uh, uh, to build this cluster, we're going to uh, use what I call uh, a random walk representation. So it's a link between the free field and certain random walks. And this is, uh, 
you know, in the heritage of uh, the sorts of things that that Simansi would have thought about, and uh, you know, of course, uh, who am I telling this to? So, so you know, there are celebrated papers that have used such random walk representations very successfully, and among the ones which are closest to the the ones that I will present, you should think about, for instance, the Bridges Fulich Spencer paper, and um, and also later uh, Dinkin and, and Lejean and other probabilists. Okay, so so the first thing I want to to explain is what is this uh, random walk representation that that we use, um, and this brings into play what are called random interlacements. So we're not doing step one, I suppose, uh, which are a construction that's due to Snitman. Uh, and, and, and these were first introduced in a rather different context. Okay, so first I'm going to describe what those are, and then I'm going to link them to, to our problem. Okay, so this is my humble take on, uh, on this construction. So um, I want to describe uh, a random subset of ZD. I call it the interlacement at level U, and U is a positive parameter. Okay, now it's actually not finite, it's, a, it's a random. Okay, so the slick definition of this set it's, is the following, is to say that for any finite subset of ZD, the probability that IU does not intersect this set is given by either the minus U times the capacity of the set. So by inclusion exclusion, this uh, uh, completely determines the set IU. Of course, that's uh, elegant, but it doesn't tell you much about this set. Um, so before I give you a more explicit uh, construction of this, let me just fix some notation. So I'm going to use um, EK to denote the equilibrium measure of K. So for a probabilist like me, this means the probability starting at X that uh, uh, the random walk uh, never uh, returns to K. Okay, so this is a this is a measure which is supported on the boundary of K. Then the capacity, which is the thing you f you saw in this formula, is just the total mass of this measure. Okay, and then there is the normalized equilibrium measure, which is just uh, this measure divided by its total mass, so it's a probability measure. Okay, so that's just some notation. Okay, so now how um, how to construct IU? So I'm going to describe how to construct IU intersected with some fixed finite set K. So here's the set K. Okay, so what you do is the following. So uh, you sample a Poisson random variable with parameter u times capacity of k. And then you sample, so I'm going to have n random walks, where n is this n. And uh, the starting point of those random walks, I'm going to call them y1 up to yn. They are iid distributed according to normalized equilibrium measure on k. So they start somewhere on the boundary, and I have n of them. Okay, and now for each one of those, you perform a simple random walk. So of course, because you're in dimension three, you know, the walk will spend some finite time in, uh, here, but then will go away forever. Okay, and now IU intersected with K is simply the print of those random walks. Random walk means just the usual random walk. Yeah. Yeah, well, this is, you know, the slang of probabilities. Symmetric, simple, red, so, so jump to each of the neighbors is 1 over 2D. Okay, and so then IU intersected with K is just the intersection of, uh, so the print of these walks inside of K. Okay, now that's, uh, you know, that's fine. But now, of course, as, uh, as K grows, so you want to let, oops, you want to let K grow to, to ZD, 
uh, there is an obvious consistency issue. So let me draw a slightly bigger set k prime, okay, which contains k. So this is still k. Okay, now, now if you take uh, k prime or maybe k twiddle, you can do exactly the same construction again uh, in k twiddle. And when you start your random walk, well, one possibility is that it actually does not hit the set k, then there is no problem. But uh, of course it might, and then it should be described somehow by the picture up there. And the reason it, it, this is you know, consistent is because, well, if you, you know, if you start a random walk from the equilibrium measure on, on k twiddle, and you look at, uh, so suppose that this is a random walk which hits the set k. hk is the first time the random walk visits k. And suppose you, you enter it in the point x, so you enter it here, then in fact uh, the distribution of the entrance point is is the equilibrium measure on k. So you have the right uh, distribution to, to make this picture consistent. You know, since we have many mathematical physicists in the audience, this is like the DLR equation for the random walk, if you prefer. OK. So, um, okay, so now you can, you can uh, define this uh, consistently as you grow k. And it's also clear how to recover this picture from the one above what you need to do is you need to take your random walk here, and now you just sample a simple random walk. So sorry, I will continue saying simple. <laughs> uh, condition to not hit k again, OK? And you follow it until it's, it, it last exits from, from the bigger set k tilde. And if you reverse the speed between the two, you can view it either as you know, a backward part here or part of the forward trajectory here. OK, so what, uh, what can I say in conclusion? The, the way you should think about this at IU is you should think of a, a Poisson cloud or a Poisson point process of bi-infinite random walks. OK, and if I want to describe the law of one random walk that hits the set k, so let me put time equal to 0 when it first enters uh, in k, then the, the entrance point is uh, distributed according to normalized equilibrium measure on k. Forward part is a simple random walk. Backward part is a simple random walk. Condition not to hit k again. OK, so that's the interlacement. Now let's, uh, let's collect some properties of this set. OK, so so for any u positive, so first of all, what does u, what's the role of u in this game? u controls how many trajectories enter in the picture. So if you raise u, get more trajectories, the, the, the set iu grows. OK, so, so there is an obvious way to couple this thing in u just by labeling the trajectories. And, and you can make sure that iu is contained in iu prime if u is less than u prime. OK, moreover, iu is uh, an infinite set. That's clear because it consists of, of random walk trajectories. And also, it's connected. So it enters in the number of trajectories. Bigger u, more trajectories. And you know, to lay to to couple everything in you, okay. <laughs> okay, and uh, so I will elaborate on this connectedness. In fact, we're going to show that that it's very well connected. Uh, probably not today, but in the talk tomorrow. And uh, this is essentially what is going to allow us to use this set IU to build the sign cluster that I'm looking for. Okay, so so we're going to use IU to build uh, this guy. 
structures. That's all on the lattice at this point, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. Let's stay on the LAN. <laughs> um, okay, so, so that's, uh, that's one thing. And then, um, uh, just because I'm going to need it, I can introduce LXU, which are the local times uh, corresponding to this. So what is LXU if you are at point X? So here is X. Uh, LXU just, so think of these random walks and being continuous in time, okay? So they, you spend an exponential one uh, uh, every step. X just collects the amount of time any of the trajectories in the loop soup spend at X. Okay, so, so, so these are the local times. So in particular, uh, IU is just a set of points where the local time is strictly positive. Okay, so this is uh, for x and z at this point. Okay, and um, and the last thing that I want to to remark is that so this uh, construction was originally introduced uh, in order to study the complement of the interlacement, which is called the vacant set at level u. And there is a theorem of uh, Snitman. And also Sidoravicius Snitman uh, from 2010, which tells you that uh, uh, this guy has a phase transition in U. So there is a U star, which is uh, strictly between 0 and infinity, uh, such that uh, above U star, new U does not percolate. And below U star, this new u, uh, v u, has an infinite uh, cluster. This is dimension dependent. The u star, yes, of course. And when I'm, is this was a three and higher. Or yeah, yeah. So everything is in three, three and higher. Okay. So you won't see much of of v u today. I, I I should say more about this because uh, it's actually important. So originally, this was supposed to model local limits in. Uh, in uh, random walks on, on large uh, finite graphs. I, I won't go more in, in, into this uh, uh, now, but um, what I want you to, to notice is that we're going to be interested in this thing when u goes to 0, because that's going to correspond to h going to 0 in some sense. And uh, you have to realize that, that this percolation model has a very different uh, geometry than uh, the usual percolation models you might be um, uh, accustomed to because you see as u goes to zero the density of this guy goes to zero so this guy occupies most of the space so it's clear that this guy should have an infinite component but mind that iu no matter how small u is retains an infinite connected component so this is not at all like uh, you know ordinary percolation on zd or even percolation of the free field okay so so in fact, uh, Snitman had conjectured, so there are still some uh, open conjectures about positivity of u star on more elaborate graphs, for instance, fr fractal graphs. And, and these uh, questions are related to Leibovitz's conjecture. And uh, so I think we have something to say about this as well, but uh, I won't bother you with that today. <coughs> OK, so, so now that's all nice and well, but what is the link to our problem? OK, so, so there is, in fact, a link already at the discrete level, but I'm going to need a slight improvement to a continuous structure. So, so I, I'll first describe this, uh, this extension. So this is called the cable system. So what is the cable system? Uh, what you do is you take your lattice, and, and you, you do the following. So here's a point x, a neighboring point y. You replace each edge by a, 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 a so-called cable, okay, which is just a copy of the unit interval. And then you glue these uh, cables through their endpoints. So this gives you uh, a metric space, if you like. There's a natural metric on this. And there is also a natural Lebesgue measure. And the nice thing about this guy is that it's actually continuous. Okay? If you actually want to take one thing away from my talk, this uh, 
this can help you in many instances, uh, as you will see, because sometimes in the discrete world you sort of miss the continuous structure. What's the connection between x and y? So, so before you just had an edge, and now you think of this edge as being really a unit interval that, 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 that is here. So you, you really think of this as a continuous space. That's it. This is the nearest neighbor edge, right? Yeah. Okay. Is, is it clear that? Yeah. The so the well, the, the, the point is that I can extend, so that's what I'm going to say now, is that I, you can extend all the quantities that I introduced to this cable system. And for instance, the, the free field now becomes a continuous field. OK, so, 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 so how do you do that? Well, there is a natural diffusion uh, on this cable system. I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to describe what the random walk is now. Some refer to this as a quantum graph where the functions are supported. Yeah, OK. <laughs> so let me describe the random walk on this thing, OK? Uh, suppose I start in x. What I do is, is um, I sample a Brownian motion until the first time it hits either minus 1 or 1, OK? And now I look at, at a fixed excursion of this uh, of this Brownian motion, say the ith one. And uh, I flip a coin, which has 2d sides, so it's a funny coin, uh, to determine, uh, you know, to choose one of the neighboring edges of x. And then once I've chosen, let's say, this one, I just run that excursion on this edge. And I continue with the next one. OK, now you might ask, uh, what is the ith excursion, or what is the first excursion, you know, because the, the Zero points accumulate. So, so, but of course, the excursions are nicely organized in a Poisson process. The intensity measure is a Ito's excursion measure, so you can just label them. And you take the one with the smallest label, then the one with the second smallest label, etc. And at some point, you're going to use an excursion that's you know, going to go to distance one. And then you reach whichever cable you had chosen. And now you start over, take a fresh bound in motion, and, and start again. Okay. And if you don't start here, but start in the middle, well, you just run a Brownian motion until you hit either here or here and, and continue. So that's the, that's the continuous diffusion, the Brownian motion on this cable system, if you like. OK, so now it's clear that I can extend all the quantities that I introduced. So phi can be extended to a, a continuous uh, uh, free field on, on this cable system, and the green function is just the green function of this diffusion. Uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to say there is another way you can think about the free field, of course, is uh, you first sample the free field uh, on the lattice, and then given that, you just uh, sample a Brownian bridge, an independent Brownian bridge between the two endpoints for each cable. And the reason for that is because you can think of this as the scaling limit of you know, a long one-dimensional chain. And the free field on the one-dimensional chain is, is just a, a random walk, right? It's a product measure in the increments. So if I take the usual Dirichlet form on the cable graph, yeah, the you can do that as well. Of that's course. the same. Yeah. So I think that's quantum. Okay. So um, so that's the free field, and similarly, I can extend my uh, interlacement set U to an interlacement set. Uh, on this cable system, just do exactly this construction and replace the simple random walks by copies of this uh, diffusion. And, uh, and, and by doing that, the local times will actually also extend. And all the fields I have here so are continuous in space, right? The, the free field in particular is also continuous. OK. So now uh, you'll see why I bother to do this. In, uh, in a few minutes, so bear with me. Okay, so now I can state the link between these quantities. So the link comes as a theorem that has a um, uh, pretty long history. So the, the version I'm going to state is due to Titus Lupu the very recent. And uh, so let me state the theorem first, and then I'll comment on it. So the theorem says that there exists a coupling of uh, phi i u 
and gamma tilde. So these are all processes on my cable system. So this is a Gaussian free field, this is an interlacement, and this is another uh, Gaussian free field on the cable system. And this coupling has two properties. The first one is that uh, IU and gamma are independent. And the second one is that almost surely you have the following. If you take the local times of, uh, of these interlacements and you add 1 half of gamma tilde squared, then this is actually equal to this function of phi tilde. Now, the fact that this is true in distribution, which is of course implied by the almost sure equality, uh, you can check more or less directly, and it was done uh, uh, by Snitman and is based on an earlier paper of, uh, of uh, Marcus Rosen, uh, she, uh, and I'm forgetting two authors, so let me look them up. So the relevant contributors are uh, Marcus, Rosen, Eisenbaum, Caspi, and Xi. They did it basically for one random walk. And the, the equality and distribution, you can check, you know, uh, not immediately, but you, you can compute the Laplace transform of the Laplace functionals on, on, on either side. And everything is explicit because the free field has an explicit uh, Laplace functional and this guy as well because it's a Poissonian uh, uh, loop soup. OK, so equality and distribution was, was already known. Okay, what's the first term? The distribution this is the local times you know, the, uh, corresponding to the interlacement. OK, and so there are similar results. For instance, there is a precursor theorem of, of Dinkin, which is really now uh, reinterpreting results of uh, Spencer, uh, Froelich, and, uh, and Bridges. OK, the merit of Lupu is to have uh, lifted this uh, equality in distribution to an almost sure equality. And uh, I just want to spend yeah, five minutes to uh, stress what the difficulty is. So of course, you can start on the left-hand side and say, OK, I sample this guy and this guy independently, and that defines the right-hand side. That's fine, but you see there is this nagging square here. So the issue is really to recover the sign of this, of this field on the right-hand side. and the way this is done, so it's, it's uh, bringing the following idea to high art, but, but at, at its root is the following simple observation. If you take the Gaussian free field on this cable system, or any continuous Gaussian free field for that matter, what you can do is, suppose I sit somewhere, okay, on the field at some point, I, I can explore the sign cluster around me, okay? And the free field has a Markov property, much like Brownian motion. So exploring my sign cluster, that's a stopping set, much like a stopping time. So even though this set is random, I can still do the decomposition just like if I were conditioning on a fixed set. And so I can write the field where I am as some local field, which is the free field killed when hitting the boundary of my, of my sign cluster, plus the harmonic extension of the field on the boundary. But the bound at the boundary, because I have a continuous field, the field is zero. So the harmonic extension is zero. So once I explore my sign cluster, I'm actually completely independent of what happens outside. And so to determine what my sign is and that of all the guys in my cluster, I just have to flip a coin. And this is how you recover what the sign is from this. This is very you know, reductive, but that's essentially the idea. OK, and now once you have this uh, almost sure inequality, what does it do for us? So, so implications. Well, so, so the observation is that if you look at a point on the interlacement, then you know that this left-hand side is strictly positive, and this guy you just neglect. I mean, he's non-negative anyways. All the fields here are non-negative. OK, so you know that uh, the right-hand side is strictly positive. But in fact, you know more, and this is where you really need the continuous uh, structure. You know that the sign of this guy 
has to be constant on the interlacement because it's a connected set. OK, so now you have two options, right? So either uh, phi plus square root of 2u, so phi is strictly bigger than square root of 2u on the interlacement, or uh, I guess, yeah, I should uh, do this. Or it's, uh, it's less than that. OK, and now if you are in the second case, then we're done. Because this guy uh, is infinite. So it's, in fact, contained in, in, in a guy like this, which by symmetry is, uh, has the same law as, I, as if I was looking at, at this. And, and so I take the print on, on ZD, and, and that's it. OK, so, so that's nice. But in fact, you, you can show that this case doesn't happen. So. So the smiley goes away. I have to have some fun as well. Right? OK, so, so but you, know, you, don't, you don't need to know that. You, you can just note that, OK, if this happens, we're done anyways. And so now we can assume that we're in this situation. And you know it doesn't happen. So you can show in the continuum that, that in fact, you, know, you could introduce an h star tilde, which is the same thing on the continuum. And this is, in fact, always equal to 0 which is also interesting because that's regardless of dimension. So that means that the cable system has a very different geometry than Euclidean geometry. It doesn't capture the, it's continuous, but it's, it's a weird guy. Uh, yeah, but you know, you have these long one dimensional rods. So of course, uh, these things are slightly different. Yeah. OK, I, I don't want to elaborate on, on this more. The, OK, so now we, we have, you see, we have reached our goal. Because uh, this now means that I can build uh, my, you know, think of u as being very small. I can build a, an infinite cluster above small negative level using my interlacements. And, and this is how we're, so this is now making uh, essentially the result of, of Leibovitz explicit. And, and this guy has a lot of nice properties which translate to this, and, and, and that's what I'm going to state now. OK? So. So this is now part two, which which will be proven uh, tomorrow, so, so sort of a stability result. OK, so, so the theorem is the following. Uh, if you have um, any coupling, I'll tell you why I need to work at this level of generality in a second. Any coupling of a Gaussian free field phi and an interlacement IU. Yeah. Uh, so this old, the older theorem that h star is asymptotic to yes. that proves h star is positive for very large d sure. by an entirely different method. That's yeah, that's by using the fact that if you're in high dimension, it's very hard to close a loop. So you have a lot more independence because things look like on a yeah, tree. I understand that yeah. it's harder to close a loop, but you're able to. Well, you, you can also somehow yeah. use this yeah. to show so that. Yes. So in high dimensions, what you should essentially think is that the Gaussian free field, at least locally, if you don't go too far, is just IID Gaussian field. That's right. So you still have the, the strong interactions, but locally you know how to start building clusters. And then you need to connect them. OK. So we're back to dimension three. OK, so I need to, so I'm considering any coupling of, of the continuous free field on my cable system and, and of the interlacements. And, and, and the reason why I have to consider any coupling is, of course, that this is a nice result, but you should appreciate that these two quantities are not at all independent, right? Uh, so they're, in fact, very correlated because <coughs> they come out of this specific construction. 
OK, so if I have any coupling of a free field and an interlacement, uh, I can find a subset of a continuous subset of ZD, in fact, open with the following properties. First property is that this set A tilde is infinite and connected. The second property is that uh, it's included uh, inside of the interlacement, this guy. And the third property, so so far I haven't said anything, really, is that if you look at the free field in a neighborhood of this infinite set, so I look at the absolute value in the, say, in the one neighborhood of this set A, Okay, is it clear if this is A, then the one neighborhood is everything which is at distance at most one? Then, in fact, I can, I can make sure that, that the free field in the neighborhood is not too large. And so K of U here, so it's important that uh, this is something which diverges when U goes to zero, but not too fast. OK. So of course, you know, I'm saying this is a robustness property, but it's not, uh, it's not at all clear because the, you know, the question is, why is this really a perturbation? I mean, it's OK to ask of the field locally to be not too large, but I'm actually, you know, I want to have a, an infinite connected set where in the neighborhood the free field is sort of well behaved. So, so there is some work uh, needed to prove this. Now, let me explain to you why this is actually uh, doing anything for us. So this is now step three. Go ahead. Yes. No, it does. So, so he actually wants. So then you have to think about what it what it means for the discrete case. But you see, if you want to do it directly in the discrete case, this description that I gave to you uh, it does not work anymore because you don't have a continuous field. But you, once you have the coupling, you could forget about the difference. That's right. So that, that's what you do. So, so in fact, this is just a partial result of his. What he's really after is to translate this back to, to, to the discrete, and, and you can do that. But you, you continue with the continuum. Yes. No, uh, so you will see that I still need the continuum in this uh, last step. <coughs> in fact, I, I will sort of exploit the continuum to, to my advantage. There is a, no. OK, so you're ahead. That's why you OK, so suppose that, that this theorem is true. And now, uh, now let's see if we can uh, if we can get what we want. So I'm going to apply this theorem with uh, the coupling. Let me call this coupling Q prime. Okay, this is any coupling, and I'm going to choose the one. I didn't give it a name here, so let's call the coupling here Q. Where's Q prime equal to Q? So. So I have this theorem, and in particular, I have this result uh, available, which I, I mark by star. So, so I have uh, a set A star satisfying 1 up to 3. These three can do. OK. So <laughs> and moreover, because I chose this coupling, I also have star. So what does that mean? So that means that, in fact, my set A not only is in IU, but it's, it's also contained in this guy. OK. So let me make a picture. Here is my cable system. OK, now I have my set A tilde. 
I'm trying to be a Brownian motion, but that's not easy. <laughs> OK, so this is my set A tilde. OK, and inside of A, I have maybe a vertex that I will call x. And now, um, so you know, this means uh, that the field phi is bigger than minus square root of 2u. And moreover, in, in the neighborhood of this set, I also have some, some control. Phi does not get too large. OK, so what I do is the following. So I'm going to split the cable system by introducing the midpoints on the cables. So, yeah, yeah, that's so mx are the midpoints around x. So there are 2D of them. I hope it's, it's clear what I mean. OK, and m is going to be uh, all of those midpoints. So. And you see that once I introduce those midpoints, the, the cable system uh, factorizes in these sort of uh, crosses that you have everywhere. OK, and now I claim that I have the following lemma, which will conclude the argument. So there exists a coupling of uh, my phi and my iu. There are these two guys that come from my theorem. And another free field, which I will denote with this phi. But this is now a Gaussian free field on ZD, OK? It's a discrete one, not a continuous one, uh, with the following property. So, so if, um, if you have the following event, if you look at, at a, a vertex x and for some half edge uh, neighboring x okay, in some direction e, uh, you have that uh, phi is, is bigger than minus square root of 2u. And moreover, uh, at the end points, the field is not too bad. So red means um, uh, phi is, is at most is large, but not too large number k. Then, in fact, uh, I can make sure that um, at the vertex, this new guy is going to pop above plus square root of 2u. OK, now why does this uh, do the thing for me? Well, because of, uh, of my point 3 here. I know that in the one neighborhood of my cluster A, my field is not too large. So in particular, if I look at a point x in A tilde, here the field is not too large, here it's not too large, here it's not too large, and as well here. And you see that now as A traverses this point, I'm going to have at least one edge, in fact, even two, but I just need one where I'm going to have this picture, for instance, this one. OK? And so, so what I'm saying is that if x is in A tilde, then this automatically happens. And so my new field at that point uh, is going to be popped at level plus square root of 2u. So, so this implies that uh, the restriction of A tilde to zd is included in uh, the infinite uh, cluster above level plus square root of 2u of this new field. OK. So, so that does it for me. So now I just need to explain to you. I still have five minutes. I was planning to say in the remaining minus five minutes, but, but, but it's actually positive. Uh, why this lemma is true. And you can perhaps almost guess it. So what you do is it's going to be an argument which works independently at every point. So proof of lemma. OK, so let me decompose the field. Let me just look at the cross around some point x. OK, say this one. And I can write this for every x. I can write this as a local field plus the harmonic extension that comes from the midpoints. OK, so that's a free field which is uh, killed when hitting either one of these boundary points. And, and this is the harmonic extension of those 
those four guys inside. And notice that all the dependence at large scale is carried in this harmonic extension. Those guys are IID as x values. Okay. Moreover, because I know that my field is not too large, this uh, harmonic extension is actually, you know, I can treat it like if it was a, a spin with a finite, uh, a compact sa state space. Okay, so this is not too large, and that's going to al allow me to work essentially conditionally on the etas. So I can sort of work quenched in the etat. Okay, and once I have this decomposition, I show the following. So what I want to show is I want to show something that uh, conditionally on the eta almost surely. So I want to show that, I guess, uh, Q twiddle almost surely. So Q twiddle, uh, excuse me, there is no Q twiddle. Q almost surely. If I look at the probability that I have to start with, so that you are uh, above minus square root of 2u, and you are not too large on the endpoints, but now conditionally on the, on the field at the midpoints, this is actually bounded by some constant times the probability that at the point x, I'm bigger than plus square root of 2u. So I want this to be really an almost sure statement. And this should be true Q almost surely on the event that uh, uh, phi at, at the midpoints around x is not too large, which is the case if x is a an A tilde. OK, now, um, OK, why, why is this? Um, I think a picture will, will be the most informative. So what is this left-hand side? Well, if I draw what's going on, OK, this is my point x. This is the midpoint uh, away from x. And in this direction, I draw phi. OK, so somewhere I have a square root of 2u and minus square root of 2u. And I know that at the end point, so for instance here, the field is not too large. So somewhere there is this large value. Uh, k, and I'm below that. And now, you know, what I want is I want the field at this point x to be above plus square root of 2u. If I'm already there, I have one, nothing to do. So I can assume that x lies somewhere in this tiny neighborhood. And now what does the free field do? Well, here I have this constraint that along this entire cable, I have to stay above this level. So, you know, it looks, my Brownian bridge looks something like this, okay? But there is a tension here because I'm starting very close to the barrier and I have to stay above. And all I'm saying here is that if I release this tension, so if I remove the fact that I have to stay above in the entire cable, that gives me a little room to breathe and I have enough room to actually make the field pop right here above the level square root of 2. It's just a Gaussian calculation at this point. Okay, and, and so this is why you get that this statement and now when u is sufficiently small, you can make sure that this constant is at most 1. So now you pick a u such that this constant is less than 1, and you have this, uh, this uh, comparison. And now it's clear how the coupling goes. You see, you can call this left-hand side p and this right-hand side q. I haven't touched the eta. Right? This is a statement about, about psi. So now for every one of those crosses independently, I do a coupling of a, a Bernoulli p and a Bernoulli q when, when q is bigger than p, just using an independent uniform random variables, just like in ordinary percolation. And that creates, creates this field phi, which has the property that I want. So there is this kind of, you know, it, it's a little bit like entropic repulsion, if you like. And, and you can use the fact that you have the tension on the cable to, to, to actually uh, make a, you know, a discrete point go, go up a little bit. Because you know, we should think of this as being tiny. So, so the, the upshot of, uh, of our quantification of Leibovitz is not only that we co construct a discrete cluster above minus epsilon, but that we construct a continuous one. And, and then we can, we can use the sum of the continuity to, to actually make it happen. OK, that's 
the end of my talk. Thank you.